I'm Mark Arendis, and this is Euler's Melting Pot. In this challenge, we try to complete every Project Euler problem in a different programming language. Today's challenge is problem number one. Find the sum of all multiples of 3 or 5 below 1,000. This is a variation of the popular interview question, FizzBuzz. Interviewers find it useful as a quick test of whether or not the candidate understands basic control flow and looping constructs, as well as serving as a good talking point to start seeing how the candidate thinks about problems. We can list a few of the solutions by hand. Multiples of 3 are 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, and so on. Multiples of 5 are 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and so on. Crucially, there's overlap starting at 15, so we can't simply count the multiples of 3 and 5 separately, or we'll double count some values. We'll need to do some divisibility checks, and to that end we'll need something called the modulo operator. This operator is written in Python and many other languages with the percent sign character. The modulo operator returns the remainder after we divide two numbers. For example, let's consider 23 modulo 7. The number 7 goes into 23 a total of three times and then some fractional part. Three times gets us up to 21, but we can't go a fourth time since that would be 28, which is larger than 23. The remainder between the number we can get to, 21, and the number we want, 23, is 2. So we say 23 modulo 7 is 2. In particular, we can use the modulo operator to check for divisibility. If x modulo y happens to be 0, then there's no remainder after dividing y into x, which means y divides evenly into x. We might solve our programming challenge in Python as follows. Iterate over all the numbers from 0 up to and excluding 1,000. If our value modulo 3 is 0, or our value modulo 5 is 0, then we know our value is divisible by either 3 or 5. In that case, we add our value to the total. At the end of the loop, print the total. This will get us a working and efficient solution. And indeed, Python is a great prototyping tool for a lot of reasons. But we won't be using Python today for our full solution. We'll get to our language of choice in a minute. First, let's talk a bit about functional programming. Functional programming is primarily based on building up functions and data. Rather than running something like a loop, as we've done here, and changing variables, we would build up appropriate data structures, such as lists. This more closely mirrors how a function works mathematically as the deterministic mapping from inputs to outputs. For example, add one to a number is a purely mathematical function. It takes input and produces, in a deterministic manner, an output that doesn't depend on any external state. Conversely, pick a random number from one to 10 is not, at first glance, a mathematical function because it seems to take no input, but still produces a different output every time it's called. In our particular example, first we generate a set of all the multiples of three less than 1,000. In Python, the range function produces a list of these numbers, and then we convert it to a set. We want these collections to be sets so we can perform an efficient set union operation in a moment. Next, we generate the same set, but for multiples of five. Then we take the union of these two sets. In Python, we can take a union of sets with the vertical bar operator, the same vertical bar that we might be accustomed to using for a bitwise OR operation. Finally, we take our resulting set, Calculate its sum, printing the result. This approach is more focused on building data up, representing our solution, and composing existing functions. It more closely mirrors the language we'll be working with in a few minutes. This is Haskell, a purely functional programming language. A language like Haskell is considered purely functional because it enforces functional programming paradigms. Every function in Haskell is a genuine mathematical function, in that it takes input and maps it in a deterministic and reproducible way to output. If we want to write a function which produces a random number, we would need to take an extra argument consisting of the explicit random number state. In this example, our random function takes a random generator state, which is presumably some data type we created specifically for this purpose, and returns two values, a random integer and a new random number state. Remember, in a functional language, we don't mutate variables in place, so we instead return a new random number generator that is presumably a slight modification of the original. The random generator state argument itself is whatever we need for our particular algorithm. For basic algorithms, it could be as simple as an integer seed. For something like the Mersenne twister, it would be the input array of bit strings. Your initial inclination might be that this is terribly inefficient, producing temporary values at every possible point in the program. And indeed, 20 years ago, that may have been true. But the technology of garbage collection and automatic memory management has come a long way in the past. In particular, the most popular Haskell compiler, GHC, 
uses something called generational garbage collection, which ensures that there's always quick, efficient space for large amounts of short-lived temporary values. When we need some complex external state, like a file on a computer or a web page, that's a bit more of a difficult problem to encapsulate in a nice mathematical way. There's not a simple extra argument we can pass into functions that interact with the real world outside our program, like we could in the case of the random number generator. In Haskell, we solved this problem using something called monads. Monads aren't as complicated as some people make them out to be, but they're also not simple enough for me to explain in the space of the next two minutes. So for now, it suffices to know that mathematicians have a way of modeling such real world effects. Now, back to our example program. We generate two lists. Namely, the list of multiples of 3 up to 1,000 and the list of multiples of 5 up to 1,000. Then we use the built-in union function to make a list of all the elements that appear in either of the arguments. The Haskell union function is a set union. So if an element appears once in each input list, it will only appear once in the result. Once we have the list union, we call the sum function, which does exactly what it sounds like. It adds up a list or other foldable collection and returns the sum. Finally, we print the result to the screen. Now we have a solution in both Python and Haskell. But we want to solve over 700 of these challenges. That means we need to come up with over 700 languages. So we won't be using the mainstream languages like Python and Haskell for anything more than prototyping for a long while. Enter GolfScript. GolfScript is a stack-based golfing language. Let's break down that terminology. Code golf is the art of solving programming challenges in as few characters as possible. For example, we might take our Python program from earlier and compress it down into something a little more like this. There are entire websites dedicated to code golfing, both as an art form and as a sport. For this challenge, we're not particularly interested in minimizing the length of the code, but GolfScript is still a perfectly capable language that we can use to solve problems. Stack-based means that most operations in the language, rather than operating on variables, operate on a global value stack. For example, in Python, if we want to add two numbers, we might write 1 plus 2. In a stack-based language like GolfScript, we would write 1, 2, plus. In Python, this expression consists of two arguments, which happen to be literal numbers written to the code, combined together with a binary operator. If we remove any of these three parts, we have a syntax error. On the other hand, our golf script code is actually three separate independent statements. Let's break it down. The first statement is a literal which, when executed, pushes the number 1 onto the stack. The second, likewise, is a literal which, when executed, pushes the number 2 on the stack. Finally, the third is a built-in function, or a block in GolfScript terminology. When the plus is encountered, it pops two values off the stack, adds them together, and pushes the sum. Note that plus will always pop two values. If we wanted to, say, add three numbers together, we would use the plus function twice. We also don't need to explicitly output the result of the program. In GolfScript, any values left on the stack at the end of the program are automatically printed to the screen. Functions in GolfScript are called blocks and they're enclosed in curly braces. This is a block in GolfScript. When this block is called as a function, it will push the number one onto the stack and then add the top two stack elements. The assumption at this point is that the caller of the function pushed another value onto the stack beforehand so that the result of our function will be the caller's value plus one. We can assign this function to a variable and then we can call it like so. Here's what happens. The first statement in this code is the entire block. A block, as a whole, pushes itself onto the stack when executed. The second statement is the colon followed by the name. This is a special kind of statement in GolfScript which allows us to assign a name to a value. It's most commonly used with blocks so that we can write our own function-like construct in our program. Specifically, it takes the top value of the stack, which is a block in our case, and associates the name to that value. It does not remove the value from the stack. Next, the semicolon removes the top value from the stack, since we no longer want the block taking up stack space and printing out at the end of execution. Now, we push 10 onto the stack, then we call our add1 function, which we made a name for a moment ago. At this point, 10 is on the value stack, and our code execution jumps to the inside the block that was associated to add1. Inside the block, we push 1. At this point, there are two values on the stack, 10 and 1. Now, we execute the plus sign, which takes the two values, 10 and 1, adds them together, and pushes the result onto the stack. The block is over, so we return to the call site. At the call site, our program execution is over, and the final stack consists of the number 11, so that value is printed to the screen. A lot of these spaces are only necessary for human readability. The GolfScript parser can do fine without most white space. In fact, in our particular program, none of it is necessary. This does the exact same thing, but is seven characters shorter. 
as I mentioned before, in our case, we're not particularly interested in minimizing code length. So we'll be using white space when it benefits readability. Now, onto our actual solution. We're going to take the same approach as our functional solution from earlier. So we'll generate two lists, union them together, and then take a sum. First, we need all the numbers from 0 to 999. We could write them all out, but I'd rather not. Fortunately, GolfScript has a primitive for this. 1000, like all the other numbers we've seen, simply pushes itself onto the stack when executed. The comma instruction pops a single numerical value off the stack and produces an array of all the numbers from 0 up to the given argument exclusive. After we run this program, there will be a single element on the stack, which is an array consisting of all the numbers from 0 to 999. Note, this is different than having 1000 different numbers on the stack. It's still one value, that value just happens to be an array. Now, let's see which elements are divisible by 3. One other quirk of golf script is that many built-in functions are overloaded. So incidentally, the comma instruction is both the range function we used just now, and also the filter function we're going to use next. Specifically, if the first value the comma pops is a block, this function pops an additional value which should be an array. It runs the block for each element of the array and keeps only the elements for which the block returns true. Where true in golf script is defined roughly as it is in Python, any non-zero, non-empty value is true, while the empty array, zero, the empty string, and the empty block are false. For example, this block would take our array from earlier and keep only the elements bigger than 500. So after execution, there would be a single value on the stack, an array consisting of all the numbers from 501 to 999 inclusive. In our case, we want to know which elements of our array are divisible by 3. The modulo operator in golf script is, like in many languages, the percent sign, and we want to keep elements where the remainder is 0. So we'll perform the modulo operator and then a logical negation, which turns false values like 0 into true, and any non-zero value into false. This will work. However, as it turns out, we can do one better. Many things in golf script are overloaded, and that includes the percent sign. If applied to numbers, it performs the modulo operation. But if applied to an array and a number, it takes every nth element of the array where n is the input number. In our case, we really want every third element of the array, so we can simply write this. Now, we can do the same thing with 5. It seems a bit wasteful to generate our thousand element list twice, so let's duplicate the initial list instead. The dot function in golf script pops an element off the stack, and then pushes the same element twice, effectively duplicating the top element of the stack. In this program, 1000 comma, as before, generates a big list. Then the dot duplicates it. Then we take every third element of the top list without changing the bottom one. By the end of this program, we have two elements on the stack, one list of multiples of three, and one list of all of the numbers from zero up to 999. We want the thousand element list on top of the stack so we can work on it now. So let's swap the top two stack elements with backslash. Then we perform our every fifth element operation, just like we did before. Now our two lists are on the stack. We want to take a set union of these lists. Unions in golf script, as in many languages, are done with the vertical bar. Great, this is a list of all the numbers we're interested in. Now we just need to take a sum. We know how to add two numbers together with the plus sign. If we wanted to add three numbers together, we could just use the plus sign twice. For four numbers, we could call it thrice and so on. But we want to use the plus sign to combine all the elements of an array whose size we don't necessarily know in advance. This is an example of something called a fold, also sometimes called a reduction. We have a binary operator like plus, and we want to fold or reduce our array by applying the binary operator to consecutive elements until there's only one total value left. This operation is called fold L for fold left in Haskell. And in Python, it's available as reduce in the functools built-in module. In golf script, the star function acts as a fold. Again, braces denote blocks in golf script. So the plus in braces is a binary function which adds two numbers together. Then the star folds the list we've built up using this function. In summary, this reads, take all the numbers up to 1,000, keep the multiples of 3 and the multiples of 5, and then sum the result. And if we run it, we get 233,168, the correct answer. And that's problem number one in golf script. Tune in next week when we tackle the second problem in a language affectionately referred to as BF.